To understand the revolutionary impact the teachings of Jesus had on the world of Judaism and the accepted theology of his day, we must delve into the confusing world of Pharisaic law and rabbinical interpretation that formed the religious backbone of the Jewish nation. In the Jewish world, religious doctrine was political law. He who controlled the religious doctrine controlled the accepted concept of righteousness and its political application. We see this Pharisaic concept vividly portrayed in the writings of Rabbi Akba, who wrote shortly after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, that any person who reads non-canical books would not share in the afterlife. Jesus came on the political and religious radar screen, not teaching like the scribes and Pharisees. The multitudes were astonished because Jesus taught the Word of God with authority, not religious debate. Since this is the case, then how did the scribes and Pharisees teach religious doctrine? What kind of religious text did they use? The root of Judaism can be traced back to the age of the patriarchs and Abraham. He introduced the concept of monotheism, the belief in one God, and his descendants being the covenant people of God. Judaism evolved from sacred texts and traditions being interpreted to the people by the priesthood of Aaron and the tribe of Levi. The heart of the Jewish law can be summed up by these two verses in the book of Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. According to traditional Jewish belief, God revealed his laws and commandments to Moses on Sinai. The writings of Moses became known as the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. These books are Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. The writings of Moses form the backbone of the Jewish sacred writings known as the Torah. The heart of Judaism revolved around the study of the Torah. The Torah is the most important document in Judaism but it is also revered as the inspired Word of God by Christianity and Islam. The word Torah means teaching, instruction, scribe, or law in Hebrew. By the days of Jesus, the concept of the Hebrew Bible expanded to include the Torah, the prophets, and the sacred writings. It's important to note that the Torah is not the whole Hebrew Bible. When Jesus read from the Isaiah scroll in the Nazareth synagogue, he was not precisely reading from the Torah, but he read from the prophets that were considered sacred and divinely inspired alongside the Pentateuch of Moses. Canonization process of the Hebrew Bible is not clear in the historical record and most Bible scholars and archaeologists cannot agree on a clear timeline. The first record of a compiled list of books that evolved into the Hebrew Bible comes from the period of the Second Temple, approximately 515 B.C., to its destruction in 70 A.D. by the Romans. According to tradition, during the early days of the Second Temple, Nehemiah found a library and a collection of books about the kings and prophets and the writings of David. The book of Nehemiah suggests that the priest scribe Ezra brought the Torah back from Babylon to Jerusalem during the construction of the second temple. Tradition also indicates that Ezra translated the Torah into the Aramaic Targums and these writings were read to the people. The Septuagint is the Koine Greek version of the Old Testament, 
translated in stages between the 3rd to the 1st century BC in Alexandria, Egypt. This translation began under the auspices of Ptolemy Philadelphus II around 265 BC and was published in stages until the middle of the 1st century BC, only about 50 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. The writings of Philio of Alexandria, a Jewish theologian and historian who was a contemporary of Jesus, and Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, ascribed divine inspiration to the Septuagint. The Greek translation was received around the Roman Empire with acceptance and veneration. This translation formed the basis of the old Latin versions, including the Latin translation of Jerome in the early fifth century who compared the Septuagint with the available Hebrew manuscripts. In 93 AD, in the central coastal city of Jamna, a consortium of Jewish rabbis finalized the canon of the Hebrew Bible at the current 39 books that we see in the Christian Old Testament. Alongside the expanded written Torah, Judaism revered the Talmud as a collection of opinions and thoughts concerning the Torah. During the days of Jesus, Jewish scholarship was maintained through oral tradition and memorization. Rabbis expounded and debated the law, that is the Hebrew Bible, in much the same way as lawyers debate the law in courts today. The transmission of history, literature, and law through oral tradition is not uncommon in antiquity. In fact, many societies used oral tradition to communicate their history. For example, it is generally believed that the Iliad and the Odyssey was an oral history of early Mycenaean Greece, before being compiled and written by Homer. The pre-Christian Jewish rabbis were only following common tradition by maintaining an oral history and tradition of Israel. The destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD by the Romans forced the surviving Jewish scholars to codify the oral Talmud into a written record. By 200 AD, the process was nearly complete with the publication of the redacted Talmud by Rabbi Judah Hanasi. In the end, the Talmud has two components, the Mishnah codified by Rabbi Hanasi, and the Jamara, added around 500 AD. The Mishnah is a compilation of legal opinions and debates, while the Jamara is a codified form of all rabbinic law. For three centuries following the redaction of the Mishnah, rabbis throughout the Middle East, especially Israel and Babylon, analyzed, debated, and discussed the Mishnah their legal opinions form the Hebrew Gemara. The Oral Talmud contained a vast amount of material and maintained opinions of a great many subjects. The Talmud can be classified into two categories, the Halakha and the Agadah. The name Halakha is derived from the Hebrew which means to walk or to go. Thus, the word is translated as the way to go. The Halakha is the compiled religious texts and law found in the Oral Talmud. Over the years, the Halakha was codified into 365 prohibitive actions and 248 commandments, totaling 613 injunctions that became known as the Hedge Laws. These hedge laws were imposed as a means to prevent violation of the Torah. Don't be too hard on Jewish scholarship for the formation of the Halakha, because the diaspora, the forced captivity of the Jewish nation, came as a result of indifference toward the Torah. The Pharisees imposed their code as a yoke on the nation of Israel. It was the heavy burden created by these hedge laws that motivated Jesus to say, All therefore 
Whatsoever they bind you observe, that observe and do. But do not do ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and they lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. The Agadah is the part of the Oral Talmud that refers to homiletics, rabbinic literature, folklore, and moral exhortations. The Agadah is the fundamental teachings of the rabbis. The Agadah was known in the days of Jesus as the tradition of the elders. And it was this portion of the Talmud that caused the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law concerning his disciples eating with unwashed hands. Both the Halakaha and the Agadah could be changed, but a different criterion was necessary. In order to change the Halakaha, scriptural proof was necessary, along with the consensus of the Rabbinic College, while the Agadah could be changed by majority agreement of the Rabbinic College of Elders, with no scriptural proof needed. It was the oral traditions of the Talmud that Jesus exposed during his teachings and preaching. When Jesus said, that the scribes and Pharisees could help the people lift the heavy burden of the Halakaha and the Agadah, he literally meant that these men could change their oral traditions should they desire to do so. Remember, he who controls the concept of righteousness controls the people. The oral tradition was not static and unchanging. The application of the Talmud varied among various rabbinical schools. The two most famous schools were the House of Shammai and the House of Hillel. Hillel and Shammai were two great rabbis of the Second Temple period. These two rabbis had an ongoing debate on interpretation, application, and ritual practice concerning the Torah and the Talmud. These two schools of interpretation formed the religious and legal opinions that confused the common folk of Israel during the days of Jesus. The school of rabbi interpretation a person adhered to determined their politics and public opinions. Shammai was a Jewish scholar born around 50 BC and died in 30 AD. He was an important figure in the development of the core work of rabbinic literature and the Mishnah. Shammai maintained a conservative, strict interpretation of the Torah that would not tolerate liberal opinion. Shammai would be comfortable in Christian fundamentalist circles of the 20th century. Halil, the elder, was born in Babylon sometime during the first century BC and died in 20 AD in Jerusalem. He was also an important figure in the development of the Mishnah and the Talmud. Halil was renowned within Judaism as a sage and scholar who maintained a liberal interpretation of the Torah that would be tolerant of different opinions. Halil would be comfortable in Christian evangelical circles of the present day. The school of sages he developed stood at the head of Jewish interpretation until the 5th century AD. According to the writings of Halil, the love of man was considered the kernel of the entire Jewish teaching. Halil is best known for two sayings, the first being, If I am not for myself, who will be? And when I am for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? The second saying, is a form of the golden rule taught by Jesus. That which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That is the whole Torah. The rest is the explanation. Go and learn. Shammai and Halil were contemporaries in the Sanhedrin, with Halil being the president and Shammai elected to the vice presidency. After the death of Halil in 20 AD, Shammai took his place as president and resisted any attempts by the minority to appoint a vice president. With these actions, Shammai attained complete ascendancy of the Sanhedrin, 
where his conservative opinions were codified into law. The main legal opinions that permeated Israel during the ministry of Jesus were Shammai in nature. The reason why the Sanhedrin could not agree on its opinion and action concerning Jesus is simple. The Sanhedrin was the war ground for these two schools of interpretation. It is evident that Nicodemus and his associates in the Sanhedrin were pupils of the school of Hillel. Hillel's grandson, Gamaliel, succeeded to the position of presidency of the Sanhedrin after the death of Shammai in 30 AD. But the Sanhedrin would be dominated by the house of Shammai until the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Hillel's liberal interpretation of the Torah would ascend to prominence with the destruction of the temple by the Romans. The same Gamaliel is referenced in the book of Acts as a great doctor of the law and mentor to the Apostle Paul. The two schools also represented the two main political factions in Israel during the days of Jesus. The Pharisees were associated with the school of Hillel, while the Sadducees identified with the school of Shammai. To put these differences into the political terminology of today, the Pharisees would be political left-wing liberals, while the Sadducees would be right-wing conservatives. The differences of religious and political interpretation between Shammai and Halil can be seen in their writings. Shammai believed only students of good family should be admitted to the study of the rabbinate, while Halil believed that anyone with a desire should be accepted. Shammai tended to be hostile toward Gentiles who sought conversion to Judaism. Halil was far more open-minded and welcoming. Halil allowed divorce for even trivial offenses, such as burning a meal. Shammai insisted that only a serious transgression could justify a divorce. The Bible makes note of this conflict between the Pharisees of Halil and the Sadducees of Shammai in the controversy concerning the resurrection from the dead. Since the Torah does not explicitly teach on the resurrection, the Sadducees and the conservative school of Shammai rejected its truth. The Pharisees did not accept the conservative opinion of Shammai and taught the doctrine of the resurrection. This is the root cause behind the Sadducees coming to Jesus with a doctrinal challenge concerning the resurrection from the dead. The book of Acts also references the questioning of the Apostle Paul by the Sanhedrin and the conflict caused by Paul between the Pharisees and the Sadducees came as a result of the doctrine of the resurrection being called into question. This religious and political chaos boiled over into the synagogues throughout Israel and caused nothing but confusion among the populace. The scribes and Pharisees would teach doctrine comparing teacher with teacher, supporting their arguments with rabbinic interpretation. The people only knew religious debate. They had never experienced the Word of God preached with divine authority and revelation. Now it should be obvious why the common folk were astonished at the doctrine of Jesus, for he taught them as one who had authority, not like the scribes. It is so easy to look at the conflict between the Sadducees and the Pharisees and judge them to be men of arrogance and self-righteousness. The nation of Israel was divided along denominational lines, and this division resulted in a political hotbed of confusion and hatred. How true are the words of Jesus? Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. The Roman destruction of Israel in 70 AD was the desolation prophesied by Jesus as a result of their religious and political division. We look at the smoke and ash of Jerusalem's demise and think 
This could not happen to us. But are we any different? Our nation is also divided along conservative and liberal political opinions. We understand that the will of God is for His Christian people to be united in one call, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is the will of God, but we see the body of Christ fragmented and divided along denominational lines. We sit in our pews with open Bibles, interpreting everything we see and hear through the spiritual glasses of our denominational doctrine. To a Baptist, all that is seen in the Bible is Baptist theology. To a Methodist, they see only Methodist liturgy. To a Pentecostal, they see only the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. To be a dispensationalist or not to be, that is the question. In the end, does it matter? We see Jesus Christ and the Bible through spiritual glasses that filter the truth of Scripture through our denominational doctrine. What should we look for in the Bible? We should look for Jesus, not filtered by our denominational glasses. Let the words of the Apostle Paul resound in our ears. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Let us look for common ground where we relate to our brothers and sisters in Christ in the simplicity of the gospel, not division caused by foolish denominational debate. What spiritual glasses do you use to interpret the Bible and understand Jesus Christ? Should you desire to see the body of Christ united in mission and purpose, then you must honestly answer this question.